Dave, thanks for joining us today. Um, a topic we spend an awful lot of time thinking about, uh, digital transformation, just the acceleration of, of change we see in the industry. You know, when you look across, um, you know, what you see in terms of clients, competitors, your own organization, and just the, the trend of digital and what's changed, I mean, what really is top of mind for you uh, as you think about it? Well, Neil, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here with the Cybos audience again uh, this year. I'll be at digital. I remember well, I think it was 19, 2017, we had the entire world descend on Toronto. So we're in the digital world still uh, you know, in our second year of the pandemic. And as we've both seen, you know, the whole trend around digital started way before. We're on a 20 year journey now. There's yeah. certainly you know, key elements of it that have accelerated during the, the crisis, the, the pandemic, but certainly that the fundamental themes and trends started well before. And I, I put them into kind of three categories. You know, the first category that we talk about a lot is the transaction digitization, but certainly moving from transaction to relationship digitization. And right. we've seen acceleration on both sides during the pandemic, but the transaction side started a long time ago where we moved from our branch networks and our call center to online channels that accelerated for, for all age groups in the pandemic. But really the breakthrough is building relationships digitally. And we've seen that by you know, happen before. Our, my advisor launch was well before uh, the pandemic in 2020, but certainly the pandemic accelerated take up of, of you know, getting advice and seeking out advice uh, in digital channels. So I, I see this transaction to relationship and the ability to deliver the full bank through a digital channel is in a very important evolution and the pandemic certainly uh, accelerated that. The second one I like to call from a static world to a dynamic world. I think back when I first came into the retail bank and date myself 20 years ago on the credit risk side and using data and, and digitizing the entire you know, risk decision-making process. Right. We were coding software. We were coding software with knowledge and, and regression analysis, and it was a static coding. We took a piece of knowledge, we put it into code, we made scoring decisions on clients and we left it there until it stopped performing and we upgraded and when it was that was you know years later you'd upgrade it or, or, or quarters or months later i call that the static world of decision making using data and digitization moving to a dynamic world of digitization where we're making decisions in real time and the models and decision processes are being updated real time by the machine itself right machine learning artificial intelligence, real-time decisioning on the marketing side, on the risk side. So very much a really important thematic of a static world to a dynamic, adjust, you know, self-adjusting world is a fundamental trend that we've seen accelerate and will continue to accelerate. And really the third piece I call from a bilateral digital world to a multilateral digital world. And in bilateral world, we built our technology our first online banking systems, our, our telephone systems, our first mobile banking apps were designed for a, a bilateral relationship. You come into our channel, you interact in our channel, and we'll serve you well. Online banking was that way. Certainly our mobile banking app is a bilateral yeah. relationship with the client. And the evolution to multilateral is we have to embed our payment products or advice products or moments of truth in multiple ecosystems, not just our own ecosystem, but into platform ecosystems, into other value chains, we have to be able to integrate into a very different multilateral world. All those are fundamental themes wrapped by this digital concept that are transforming the world of finance and banking. Right, absolutely. Okay, Dave, so when we think about, you know, just the, you know, how we've seen um, the digital transformation progress, a lot of the attendees here at Cyboss would have had business models where for the most part, they had built relationships with their clients face to face. You know, with the advent of so much digital adoption, the other side of that is that some of those relationships, you're not seeing those clients face to face as much. When you think about that effect, you know, how do you overcome or how do you capitalize on that, you know, lack of, you know, in-person proximity to your client? Any sort of thoughts about, you know, what it means and how do you overcome it? And you know, it's a great question. And, you know, we've certainly seen the impact. You take creditor insurance as an example, how right. we used to sell that after, you know, closing a mortgage and cross-selling into the insurance need or a credit card balance protector that we had, you know, those were key moments of truth in the yeah. insurance world. And we found in the digital world, the cross sell ratios have gone way down because it's very difficult to have that, a digital moment of truth versus the physical world. So 
we're certainly living it uh, in real time. So you know, a number of things that we, we've done uh, that are really important is you're still going to have you know, the core moments of truth with a the customer. They still have their core needs. So when you're in with a customer, you have to execute in a bigger way. Right. One of the things, as you know, uh, we've, we've built uh, at RBC is take the account opening process. And before we used to pride ourselves on getting the account open and getting the customer out the door quickly. And we innovated you know, the account open process, you know, shortened it. But at the end of the day, we didn't have time to cross out. We didn't have time. So in this world that you just described, in this digital world, when you are in front of a customer physically, you have to bundle more services. You have to take that moment of truth farther than you did before. It's absolutely critical because you, you might wait a long time to have a second chance. First step in that, as you've designed, is, is you have to be really efficient operationally. You can't spend any time processing and administrating because the client will give you less time than they did before. So take your processes down to as close to you know, zero time with the client as you can. And then you've got to onboard and embed more services at that moment of truth. So the account opening process that RBC designed is certainly around you know, getting the account open, but then activating the online banking capability, activating the mobile banking capability with the customer there, getting them set up, talking about a credit card, right. talking about reward programs, getting them set up for the, the payments journey that they're on. None of that happened before. And now that all happens in a key moment of truth. So you know, first and foremost, you really have to capitalize on, on every single interaction because they become all the more important. The second thing you have to do, which is really critical, is those customer needs still exist and they can be served in the digital world. I think we've all learned, particularly retail banks around the world, as RBC has done, is built a very effective digital advisory capability. Okay. And we call it the bionic future, you know, where our top advisors you know, meet with clients with enabling software and you have to transact a little differently with the client. You have to reach out to them, engage potentially to set that up. But once you design that capability, and you learn how to execute it, because as you know, it wasn't naturally to put the, put the tool the capability in front of the employee, they get it the first time right. through and everything works. Yeah, not a straight line. There's not a straight line. There's a lot of learning. And I think that's where you build competitive advantage yeah. is not only building the tool, but how you in, how you bring that tool into your, your sales force and your employee base and how they get comfortable using it and how you enable them. Now we have this really great concept we call sales power. Sales yep. power is the product of capacity of your sales force, number of salespeople, but more importantly, times capability. And we invest heavily in the capability of our workforce. And I think that manifests itself through tools like my advisor that allow them to do 2.7 million customer plans uh, with our, with our customers. And that cross sell and that, that depth of wallet has proven to be exceptional through that process. So, Make it make the mess, the most of every interaction, and build your digital advisory capability. Right. Dave, we've talked in the past just about the, you know this, the the prevalence of digital engagement. You know how much time consumers spend on their phone. Um, you know part of that time spent on the mobile devices in you know technology platforms and the real sort of platform business model and all the extensions those business models and big tech can, can get from that. The part of that that's different, so differentiated is just the, you know, the amount of time that the consumer can spend within those ecosystems, you know, traveling uh, within the ecosystems um, and just the client engagement. As you think about those platform business models, you know, sort of implications that we need to be thinking about within financial services, um, you know, lessons learned almost from those business models. It's such an important, you know, thematic and we talk about it extensively within the business, as you know, and it, it just, underlines a long-term theme here. You know, one, we think we look back a thousand years, 500 years, 200 years as banks, and we've always built the underlying infrastructure to the economy, whether it was, you know, moving cash in society that was used to trade for goods and services, you know, through banks and branches and vaults and then cash machines, then, you know, moving money through checks in the system. We built the underlying capability to exchange value through checks, then to credit cards and debit cards and plastic to, mobile banking, online banking, payment and checkout capabilities. So whenever there was an exchange of value for goods and services and money was transferred to, to, to execute that, we had the underlying infrastructure right, with right, partners right. and sy systems and networks exactly like Visa and MasterCard right. and others. And what's fundamentally changing is where the exchange of value is occurring is outside of the ecosystem that we've underpinned our infrastructure with, the physical world or the digital world. It's now over here. 
And therefore, we must find our way to plug in to that payments ecosystem where the moment of truth is, where the customer makes a decision. I want that, that service or product, and I'm willing to exchange value for it. So now that creates you know, the challenge for us to, you know, where do you plug your payment system in? So you know, the, the second theme around that, that that really challenges us is customer signals and intent. Yeah. You know, for most of our history as financial service institutions, the customers told their friends, their family about they're buying a house, they're starting a company, they're having a family, whatever. And when that need moved to a financial service, they were programmed to, to go to their branch or to call their branch or to go online to the branch system and, and signal th that financial need associated with that, that life moment. And we had this unique advantage that our infrastructure to the economy read that signal and then we tried to serve our, serve that need better than a competitor who had a very similar financial services offering to us. Now that world has fundamentally changed to the point where those signals are now being broadcast, broadcast uh, daily, hourly in uh, social media platforms, you know, in search bars and in, in search engines and in, in, in internet companies and e-commerce platforms right. like Amazon Pictures on, on Instagram and where right. you've been and exactly. your, your hopes and dreams are. So all everybody gets a signal often before we get to see it at the end of the day. What we've done in the short term, uh, global banks, is we shifted our advertising budget from broadcasting on TV and, and radio and print, trying to pull a customer into our channel with a need to paying for that customer on these social media, you know, e-commerce search platforms. So we're buying the customer moment of truth back at today, maybe a reasonable, say, economic rent. The concern is if that economic rent changes. Right. And therefore, the second thing I think you have to do is to, to really focus around how can you build a series of services and capabilities of the financial service institution that allows you to see that moment of truth independent of the platform right. effect. And in a more expansive and earlier way, we call it moving up the funnel of customer need uh, with, within your product or service set. So you know, I'll probably give an example, small business startups. So they would start their company, they would find you know, different capabilities from accounting software and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and EGL provider. And then they'd come to their bank and they would open a, a core you know, business account. And they would select that based on where they might bank personally or what was the most branch in proximity to their business, whatever it happens to be. Uh, we decided that we would try to automate and make it much more simple to register your, your business. So we got into the business registration process. We started a venture called Owner. Now with a few clicks, you can go through the entire business registration process that links you into the business account process, that links you into finding an accounting software package. So the whole starting up of a business ecosystem, not just the banking piece, is now within this owner capability. And we see the need in the startup intent so much early in the process. Right. We've captured that share within our platform and therefore we're not reliant on buying the search for, you know, give me the best business bank or right. we can interrupt that stream by helping them open the business. So a very important part to move up the funnel earlier into the need, not be reliant on finding and hearing about that need through social media platforms or search platforms. Now, the other example is the mortgage ecosystem. Again, mm -hmm. we have a sales force, we have branches, we wait for the customer to tell us that I'm buying a home and I need financing, often a referral from a realtor. It could be at the realtor level. We need to move up the funnel. We've moved up the funnel into the home search. So through a digital AI-based home search capability called Ojo, we're now facilitating home search. We see much earlier in the process before the decision's made that there's a, a home that's required for, uh, to, to meet that customer need. And therefore we can you know, come in with the financing at the, at the right time without buying and paying for search and other channels or, or, or social media platforms. So, you know, moving into these ecosystems earlier on gives you separate independent signals on customer need, allows you to play in both worlds in yep. pay, paid advertising, uh, customer acquisition, but also you know, curating your own customer flow. So those are all important examples, as we call moving up the funnel, seeing customer intent earlier on, and, and having some independence in the overall evolution of, of how do you find a customer in this new world of, of digital, physical, kind of bionic world. 
So Dave, as we talk about, you know, just the transformation going on across financial services, you know, the advent of digital, so much, you know, more technology coming into the business model. One of the, the fuels of that transformation is data and across the spectrum of businesses you're accountable for. There are, there are a couple of examples where you see, you know, data playing just a, you know, an outsized role in where we need to go next. You know, the data is, is everything, right? Data is the fuel that, that kind of transforms our ability to serve customers in so many ways. And I think about data in kind of in, in two places. One, how to use data internally to change processes, to create value for customers. And then how do you, you use data externally and you know, bringing more customers to right. uh, one of your business's platforms. So when we think about you know, internally, you know, one of the ways that uh, we've levered data that I think has created a significant value is within our equity trading business and our block equity trading business. You know, we used to have 40 to 50, maybe 60 you know, equity traders and the team, the artificial intelligence team, along with uh, our, our equity team uh, got together and, and built uh, an AI-based trading capability uh, through machine learning. And we've tested that over, the, over a number of years and you know, compared it to the outcomes of our of our traders and, and now a you know, significant portion of our you know, customer flow goes through what we call Aiden uh, and it executes it real time on the exchanges in the US equity markets and soon in, in European equity markets. So you know, that da data that we've collected and processed and only the, the machines can, can process that much data before. We used to code trading algorithms, but we just like credit scoring on the retail side, we built these algorithms, they're more static in nature, we put them until they didn't work. Now the machine's learning in real time, managed the entire pandemic upheaval in the markets in March and April and just kept going, right. was able to, to trade through that. So, you know, it's, it, it's amazing you know, what uh, these uh, machine learning and this AI capability can do with significant data. Uh, second example would be you know, within our, uh, retail space you're very familiar with, and you know, we call it our personal advisor space where we have Nomi, which has interacted billions and billions of times with our clients and cash flow forecasting and, and cash flow management and insight just by monitoring all of the different ins and outs in a client's account, kind of projecting forward. And again, it's, a, it's amassing an enormous amount of data that's used to forecast and give customers comfort in, in how they're going to manage their cash flow over you know, various periods of time. So. And using data internally to really create value from the smallest customer to the largest right, right. asset manager in their world, uh, data is, is an incredible flow. When we think about externally and how we use data more expansively, you know, RBC Insight Edge is a product capability that you know very well that allows us to use anonymized data to help merchants and retailers and B2C service companies really understand their customer base, their revenue flow, and to bring new customers onto their right. platform. So it's not just serving them with a financial product, but it's becoming their financial partner and helping them increase their revenue lines. So you know, using data more expansively to, to increase services and to be more valuable to your business customer has is, is been just fantastic. So internal data use, external data use, uh, you have to think more expansively as a financial institution because other service providers, whether the Shopify's of the world, uh, the other platforms are very much thinking about how they bring customers to a merchant platform or a small business platform. And therefore, if, if you want to maintain your payments capability, you have to think more expansively about the value creation for a merchant small business or a merchant commercial customer. So again, data is the flow that allows you to think and act and create value in very different ways than we would have thought even five years ago. Yeah, I mean, I can think of a couple of great examples from, to your point, the smallest, you know, consumer uh, who may have a very small, you know, share of wallet with you, to the most sophisticated, uh, you know, co uh, institutional customers, yep. then both in terms of, you know, providing insights and then productizing the data to actually can compete, you know, in a new space outside of your typical right. value chain. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. so absolutely tra transforming the industry. Yep. So Dave, we talked a lot about digital transformation, the accelerating pace that, um, you know, the industry is seeing change, you know, really hit us fueled by data and, you know, computing capability. If we think through to the, you know, what big changes are coming at us next, what are we going to be talking about at Cyboss in 2022 and 2023? And if, you know, you take some of the themes you opened, opened with, like, where do we go next? You know, you know, sometimes it takes a while for a technology to mature and have an impact. You know, we look at blockchain, for example, and, and the digital coins and central bank currencies and, uh, 
you know, that's taken a time to evolve and we're still kind of exp haven't seen the full maturity of blockchain. So you'll continue to see that evolve through a number of ways. Uh, you know, the second transformation, as we talked about in this world of static to dynamic is artificial intelligence. We're just embedding it into trading decisions. You know, we're going to expand that into fixed income and other areas. You'll certainly see that expand more and more decisions in real time with more data will be affected through machine learning. Mm -hmm. And therefore we're on a journey and uh, you're going to see you know, a lot more of that in the future, without a doubt. And then I would, in this whole theme of uh, bilateral relationship moving to these multi multilateral ecosystems, I think the transformational uh, technology that's about to hit us is 5G and IoT. When machines start increasingly talking to machines, machines start transacting with machines, is going to take the payment system that we're currently embedding and, and managing in multiple ecosystems, including on you know, social media platforms and an e-commerce platform, it's going to move it into a machine-to-machine -machine environment, a machine-to-user environment where the phone and the machine, the vending machine, the car, the refrigerator, ordering food, whatever that machine-to-machine -machine world in a zero latency world is going to explode the number of transactions, the complexity of those transactions and need for us to yet again evolve the, our capabilities to be at more, many more points than it was before. An incredible opportunity for us to build for the future, but an incredibly complex world, particularly from a cyber defense capability, oh, as, yeah. as we've taken a very small perimeter to defend to a, a larger perimeter to defend through APIs and others do now into an IoT world. Now, how do you defend that perimeter and make sure everything's safe that the whole payment system and banking system remains as safe as it is today. So a very exciting future, a future with enormous opportunity and challenge. And I'm sure we'll be talking about it next year in 2022. Yeah, no doubt. Dave, just want to say thanks for your time today. And I think we spend an incredible sort of cold face of change and just you know a number of examples of how you know digital transformation is on this accelerating pace, changing the landscape. You know, thanks for your time and as always, just for your insights. It's a pleasure. Great to see you. Thanks. So we'll end there, and I just wanted to uh, finish with a, a thanks to the Cyboss audience for, your, for tuning in today, hearing a lot more about digital transformation. Hope you have a great rest of the conference.